And the wait's over, ladies and gentlemen. I am here with stand-up comedian Sam Butler, live and in charge in a homely atmosphere. He welcomed me into his temporary home because he travels so much. I came to him. Thank hey. you for the glass of water, and thank you for being on JJG no, on the face. Thank you for having me. This is like the whitest place I've ever stayed in. Like this is like Redneckville. It's amazing. I love it. It's we're we're in a ranch. It's I, great. I, you we're at a ranch. You all can't see it, but outside, <laughs> stars like you've never seen before. We're in Marble Lord. Falls, Texas, right now. Longhorn cattle, uh, goats, donkeys. You know, uh, Absolutely. Don't, don't get too excited with the donkeys, but mm. <laughs> you know. I don't want to hear those shows. We're both from border towns. I don't want to get all like a donkey show, really. So I'm here with Sam Butler. He's an old friend of mine. He's a stand-up comedian of many years, and he's toured all over the country. I wanted to get you all to get to know him. So Sam, what have you been up to lately? Well, I just got back from New York City. I was there for a couple of weeks. We, I did the comic strip out there. Um, Plan to go back. Uh, in the middle of May, uh, I've been working a lot on a Spanish TV show uh, in Juarez. Mexico. So you're bilingual. I'm bilingual. I speak English and Spanish. So yeah. Sam Butler, bilingual, and you're working on a Spanish album. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, that's um, awesome. I uh, I have a couple of uh, TV credits in Spanish, and I've gotten to work like in Mexico City, and uh, I, I work in, in like Juarez like three nights a week, which is crazy because. At one point in time, Juarez was like the deadliest city on earth, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's great. It's great doing comedy. It's great making people laugh regardless of uh, where, you know, it's just. Uh, you know what? Everyone can use some laughter, so why not? I mean, no matter who you are, you can use a good time. Well, people always ask me, like, what, what do I want to get out of comedy? You know, like, uh, I think that's the end game with stand-up comedy is like, where do you see yourself? Where is this going to take you? What's 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 the end game? And what I tell people is that for me, stand-up comedy has always been about just making people laugh. Uh, my goal in comedy is to be funny enough to go anywhere and get up on a stage, grab a microphone, and make people laugh. For some reason, I feel like uh, the, the old cliche about laughter being the best medicine being true and I think that when you can go on stage and make someone laugh that's having a bad day or had a bad day or had a bad breakup or had a family member pass away or had a pet pass away, and you can go up there and make them forget for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, however long you can hold their attention, I feel like that's, that's a very noble profession because you get to share happiness with people. You know, there's not very many jobs where you get to share happiness with people and you can make people really happy even if it's only for a short period of time and so why not i mean that is like to me the best thing in the world have you always been uh, a quote-unquote funny dude was that how did you get started what is the what is your wolverine story what's your sam butler wolverine story your origins well what, what happened with me uh is when i was young my cousins would come over from mexico and we would have a great time sitting around telling jokes and, and some jokes we'd heard over and over again, some jokes were new, and that was something that we would do for entertainment, is sit around and tell jokes. So we always, we always had a good time with, with humor. Uh, but when I was about 14 years old, I remember I was walking down the street with my older sister and my younger brother, and I was making them just crack up. And I was just saying stuff, it was just coming out randomly, and they were dying, they couldn't walk down the street. And my older sister looks at me and she says, you should be a comedian. And I thought, yeah. I should, you know, that's a good idea. Like, I, I like comedy. I like comedians. I, I would love to be a comedian someday. So that was your aha that moment? Was like, that was like the first time I ever felt like, uh, yeah, maybe, you know. And then time passed. Uh, I turned into a horny teenager. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Fair enough. Yeah. Fair I, enough. I uh, started dating and uh, seeing chicks and... and and the next thing you know, um, I had a girlfriend, and I ended up getting married very young. And so then I took the responsibility of get, going out there and getting a job and, and making money and, and, and having a place to live. And, and then soon after, the kids followed. So I never really got to pursue comedy as, a, as an option. But I remember coming home from work tired, and I would go lay down or, or sit in the, in, in the love seat, and I mean the recliner, and kick the TV on. Seinfeld would come on. Now, 
I would watch the show because it was hilarious. But then I remember feeling a little envious that that's what I wanted to do and never really got a chance to do because I, I, I got in a hurry growing up. And so what ended up happening was I would watch the show, and I would, especially when he would be like at the club backstage talking to other comics. I remember feeling like, man, I'd love to do that someday, like to just go to a club, perform, and have that kind of camaraderie with those kind of guys. And, 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 and it kind of bugged me. Well, to make a long story short, uh, my ex-wife ends up having an affair, you know, and uh, it caught me completely off guard and everything changed drastically. So I found myself single. Um, all my friends were married couples. Uh, I didn't really want to hang out with the married couples because I didn't want them reminding me uh, about the ex-wife or asking me what happened or, or, or feeling sorry for me. So the first reaction, the knee-jerk reaction, I went to the strip clubs. You know, and I hung out there. They, nobody judges you in a strip club. You know, right, it's right. like you can be a solo dude, hang out by yourself. Nobody bothers you. And then I remember thinking to myself, "What am I doing here? This is not for me. I'm just, I'm just uh, sulking, sulking, right?" Mm -hmm. and, and and I a shout out to all the strippers out there. You guys are like uh, you're the real heroes. No, 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 <laughs> for real. And it's not it's not because of the dances. It's because I would tell them my problems, right? And they always had like some great advice. I even wanted to write a book. I wanted to call it Stripper Wisdom, you know, because they would just tell you like, this is what's going on. This is what you have to do. And I thought, man, these, these people, these ladies, because I never went to a men's strip club, but these ladies. They're all so exciting. And yeah, they have some yeah, really good yeah, advice. Just, They're like, <laughs> stop coming here. Stop coming here, yeah. <laughs> I never, I would, but those ladies, oh, those ladies got me through some rough times, like, like just, just in talking, you know, but when I kind of licked my wounds, wounds a little bit and I, I got back on my feet, I started hanging out at the comedy club and, uh, and my friends always said, you should be a comedian. It was even like an open mic contest. They're like, you should sign up, you'll win for sure. That's what we all think when we start out doing comedy. We think we're the funniest guys and we'll win for sure that it's easy. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not, but still. I went to the comedy club and I'm hanging out and this professional, long time, famous comedian uh, is sitting outside smoking a cigarette and I tell him that I always wanted to try comedy, that I, I have a few jokes and he said, I challenge you, challenge you to get on stage before the end of the week. And I said, well, they're not going to let me on stage, this was a club. And he says, no, Google it, there's open mics, there's, there's stuff you can try. I did an open mic. That Sunday night, I did open mic. My first open mic was at this club in El Paso called the OP, the Old Plantation. That was the biggest gay bar in Texas. Was it really? It really was. Oh, like, okay. I started doing comedy at a gay bar, and all my nice. friends, yeah, all my friends were like, "Watch out, dude! You you better be careful." And I was like, "Look, man, uh, you don't know gay guys. Gay guys are pickier than girls. I don't do anything <laughs> with the girls." So I'm safe, you know, there ain't no gay guys uh, coming after me. Don't worry about it, right? Not yet, you Not, big bear. <laughs> no, they, they have, like, I've, I found that out now that I'm a bear and, and I get some attention. I live in Austin, you know, I, didn't know. I, I didn't know. I didn't know, you know. Settle but, down, bear. But that was what I told myself when I first started, you know. It's like, I'm safe. I wasn't. But uh, I started doing comedy at the, at the gay bar and uh, had a good time with comedy. Uh, started out. Uh, doing uh, three-minute spots, and then five-minute spots, and before I knew it, I had a 10-minute uh, booking, then I had another booking, and I started doing shows all over town, and then I started getting paid to do shows. So it was pretty pretty incredible. But more importantly, it helped me realize that I didn't have to focus all of my energy and attention on my ex-wife and what I had with her. and Because I had, I'd been like the ultimate family man, so you're an point. actual example of that uh, old adage, uh, tragedy plus time equals comedy. Pretty much. I mean, a lot of my set, a lot of my material even today talks about that. And I have got over it a long time ago, and, and I don't really like doing that material because people go, oh, he's still hung up on his ex. I'm not. What it is is that so many people relate to that. Right. So many people relate to the breakup. So many people relate to being cheated on. Some people relate to the emotions that you go through when that happens, that it's still part of my act. Well, it's funny you brought up Seinfeld. I just listened to an interview with him recently. Like, it was a recent interview where he felt generous as a comedian. Mm -hmm. He's like, I get to give this gift 
and that's a good way to live, knowing that you're a generous person. And that's what you're doing. See, like, and I'm paraphrasing his, his point of yeah, view. Yeah, yeah, but I get the gist But of he's it, like, yeah. you know, we're doing a very generous thing by taking him away for 45 minutes, for an hour, or for whatever amount of time, even if it's just one joke. And he said that. See, I think you're more generous than I am. I love the idea of giving people a laughter, but I also like, like, the challenge. I like well, knowing if you, and I, I want to hear what you have to say about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about attacking a new bit or a new room? Is there certain kind of rooms that you feel more comfortable in versus rooms that you're like, oh, that's an uphill battle? Um, I definitely feel more comfortable in rooms that have people that are 30 years and up. Okay. Um, a lot of my material is relationship material. A lot of the material that I talk about is family material. And I, I do a couple of jokes about weed and stuff like that. Uh, a couple of bits that I have about that. But I'm not really a drug um, type comedian or I'm not really a hip hop type comedian. I'm not up to date on, on all the, the latest trends with the young people. So there, there's a little disconnect. I did a college, it was San Bernardino, Cal State San Bernardino, and it was rough. I mean, and it wasn't because of all the stuff that people are talking about political correctness. It's just, I'm 42 years old and I've lived life there think they've lived life and and there's some jokes I wrote to identify with kids like I started doing a lot of shows at hookah lounges and stuff because they were like 21 year old 22 year old smoking okay. hookahs and and that kind of got me back into that and to being able to perform and it's not my favorite I'll do it and I'll hold my own but it's not my favorite but if you get someone that's in the 30 plus range um, I feel like I can really I, identify with the audience you feel um, the connection yeah the connection is there younger people like either the the 21 19 20 21 that's a really tough age for me to, to identify with um although i can be goofy enough to entertain kids right you know but it's that that's the whole that's the gap in my in my tool bag i guess and that and it has nothing to do with political correctness i think uh, political correctness is is a tough thing, but I think if it's done masterfully, people will will not get offended. And there's people that will get offended no matter what you do. So that part of it is is. Uh, do you memorable. have Do you have a terror story like a, a moment, your first bomb, that you were just like, ah, my heart. Like, mm. is is there a moment where you where you actually had to eat one? Oh yeah. And then move uh, forward. I think the worst, and and I, you know, I'm being very open here. But uh, the first time I went on the road, there was a, a comedian. His name is uh, Luke Torres. And Luke Torres, uh, if you know anything about that guy, Google him, whatever. That guy was on a Living Color at one point in time. Um, phenomenal impersonator, energy, just one of the greatest acts I've seen. The guy is truly talented. And he sees my act. I'm working at the comedy club in El Paso as an opener. And he sees my act and he says, hey, I like you, man. You're, you're, you're pretty clean. You know, and I had, my first bits were real dirty. And then my, I was telling my, my dad about how it went. And then he asked me to tell him to do some of my material. And then I realized I was kind of embarrassed to do the material in front of my parents. So then I started to kind of trim it back and, and, and do stuff that wasn't so embarrassing. Then I realized I have two daughters. And they'll eventually see this stuff either on YouTube or on TV or something. And the last thing I want is for them to feel embarrassed that that's their dad saying all that stuff. So I, I, I started to kind of tweak my act and kind of write more in who I really am. You know, I'm not a vulgar guy. I'm not a, a, a sex-crazed guy that's always thinking about all these raunchy things. I'm talking about stuff that happens. And some of it is blue, but most of it is not. You know, I get, I you know it's, it's not that I'm going to go around talking about. And, and at first I had a lot of fat jokes, you know, and then you start to realize that there's, there's more, you know, it's like somebody said, it's like an onion. You start peeling the layers back, you know, and Shrek said and, that. Yeah, <laughs> no, probably. Right. But somebody said, somebody says okay. that. And, and that's true with comedy. It's like you start peeling the layers back and you start getting to, to the bottom of who you are. You know, uh, I watched that show. Uh, comedians in cars getting coffee with uh, mm -hmm. Seinfeld, right? And he had Howard Stern on the show. And I'm not a Howard Stern fan. So 
I kind of skipped it, and then eventually I went back to it. I am so glad I went back to it because there was something in there that I picked up that I said, holy crap, that's it. And what it was is um, they were talking about the differences between an actor and a stand-up comic. Okay, I'm and, intrigued. Yeah, they are saying, what is the difference between an actor and a stand-up comic? Because there's stand-up comics that do acting, and there's actors that do stand-up comedy, and it just depends on who you identify with. And, and the bottom line is this. A stand-up comic is on a journey to discover themselves. They want to get to the bottom of themselves, and they want to put that out there, and they want people to understand that. An actor wants to be anybody but himself. You know, and if you understand the differences between an actor and a stand-up comic... Then, then that, I think, is, is a key to knowing where you want to go with your comedy career. So many guys want to do comedy to get on a sitcom. But those are guys that want to be actors. They want to be famous. They want the fame and fortune. I want to be a stand-up comic. I want to get to the bottom of Sam Butler and, and face my demons and, and say, why am I such a loser in my mind? You know, even though you're, I think we're harder on ourselves than, than most yeah, people are. Yeah, I know you on a personal level. He's not a loser. He's doing pretty well for himself. <laughs> no, but... A lot of business talk before this yeah, interview. He was yeah. like, here's the way business works. And I'm like, yeah. why are you talking like that? He's like, you're making fun of me. That's weird. But Hey, it's, it's, you, you almost like had impersonated the monocle I was wearing. Yeah. You know, like that, you know. But we did have a lot of good business talk. And I hear, I hear what you're saying. But, you're, dude, that's that's pretty awesome. Like, Yeah, so, so for me, it's like... Um, uh, it's weird because gro growing up the way I did, my dad, my dad is a, a white guy uh, from Virginia, pretty self-confident dude, you know. But my mom was from Mexico. My mom had low self-esteem. I think that's why my dad got her. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, you know. But it's it's just one of those inferior. My mom kind of had an inferiority complex, and it's something that is very common when you immigrate to this country, and you have to you're intimidated by the language, you're intimidated by the people and authority and, and things like that, you know, and so I don't know why I grew up with that inferiority complex, thinking, thinking, uh, uh, having low self-esteem. and. But I think a lot of comics go through that. I think so, and I think that's where, where stand-up is the antidote to that. It's when you start to get to the bottom of who you are and, 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 and you start to express that, and, and it's, like, it's like taking a weight off your shoulders. And people who have listened to me and Cheeto on the Black and Tan podcast have heard our view on this, and I'm not making a shameless plug in the podcast. Okay. See, I, one thing I'm saying about comedy is I had a background that was actually full of confidence, and I was amazing and could do no wrong. Then comedy put me right back to point one to where I'm like, oh, no, I'm awful. Comedy did that to yeah, me. You'll eat humble pie if you want to do stand-up comedy and you think you'll never bomb, uh, then do it. So that you can see what it feels like to bump. And that's it's that like, camaraderie you were talking yeah. about. Because after a certain point, we've all been through something together. It's right? like a battle. It's yeah. like going to war. It's, you like, know? it's like, oh, you've been to war too. But this is the thing about stand-up comedy. Uh, uh, what you were saying about Seinfeld saying he's giving a gift. Mm -hmm. But what he's not telling the audience is that they're giving us a gift. Sure. And it's that laughter. When we get that laughter, that moment that... that, that the audience is laughing. That is like like the greatest reward that you could ever have as a stand-up comic. And I got through my divorce because I had that laughter. So not only was the audience healing, they were healing me back. That was amazing to me. That I was walking away happier and more confident and, and less hurt after a show. And they and people would come up to me and thank me and they say thank you, uh, that was really good. Uh, I was having a bad day, but but you made me laugh. I forgot about it. Thank you. And you go, yeah, me too, buddy. I, I just argued with my ex-wife about the kids, all the way up here, driving, you know, in the car, arguing, parking, getting out, running up on stage in a bad mood because you just. Ugh! And you still have to perform. You still have to flip that switch, get out there and perform. You perform, everybody laughs, you laugh, you, you look back and then you go, it wasn't so bad. I can do this again. You know? And it, it was, that's what was amazing to me about stand-up. Where was the first place that you arrived that was bigger than you were used to? You know, you're from El Paso, 
when was the first time you were starry eyed at a location where you're just like, oh my God, I'm here? Uh, Hollywood Improv. Okay. First time I ever did the Hollywood Improv, uh, it was scary. And it wasn't scary, it wasn't scary because it was the Hollywood Improv. It was scary because I had envisioned being there. And there I was. And this was such an uh, unobtainable goal for a comic from El Paso to say, one day I'm going to perform at the Hollywood Improv. And it was like, I'm going to perform there one day. The day that that happened, it was very surreal. And that kind of makes you choke a little. <laughs> I, I did okay my first time at the Hollywood Improv. They actually will grade you and uh, say whether you're allowed to come back or not. So I was allowed to come back and I performed there many times. And, uh, but that was the first time that it was really surreal. And I'm gonna say that even the comic strip in El Paso was kind of like that, first time I performed there. Because that was like, the comic strip in El Paso was like the top of the food chain for an El Paso comedian. And the first time I got to perform there and the, the club owner said, you're not bad, I'll hire you again. And I started, and I got my first week there. It was like I made it, you know. Like I'm a real comedian now. And then you, then then your then your self esteem kicks in and goes, no, you're not, you know, you ain't, you're not a nobody really thinks you're a comedian. And then you beat yourself up, and then then you go and you you get that next goal. Uh, first time that I shot a TV um, spot where I was actually uh, being filmed for television. And all the cameras are there, and you're on a stage, and there's a, a, a thousand people in the auditorium, and and you have a guy following you around with a camera, and you have a, a, a boom coming down, and, and you have a director, and he's saying, "Cut, action!" And you're going like, "Holy crap!" You know, um, I saw myself here. I saw myself here, and I never thought I'd get here. Here I am. And. I see myself doing other things. I, I don't necessarily see myself doing sitcoms, because that's, uh, that's not really where, I, where my energy and focus is. If you want to know my ultimate goal in comedy, this is my ultimate goal in comedy. My ultimate goal in comedy is to be able to walk into any room, in any city, on any stage, and make people laugh. And that is it. So on that note, What's next on the agenda? What's the next big, big obstacle that you're looking to climb? Big mountain. Um, you did that. You get there. What's next for Sam Butler? Well, I uh, I shot some TV stuff in Mexico, which was pretty intimidating. Well, that TV stuff in Mexico has led to me being booked in Guatemala. So I'm supposed to go headline a comedy festival in Guatemala in Spanish, and you gotta understand. The Mexican culture and dialect and lingo is completely different than the one in Guatemala. So that's got me kind of shaking in my boots a little bit. The promoter's like, you could do an hour right? And I'm going like, yeah, in English, <laughs> you know, but I got to do an hour in Spanish. You got and, this. But I got to do an hour in Spanish um, relating to the local humor, right, which is hard. I, I had a hard time transitioning from U.S. Spanish comedy to Mexican U.S. Uh, uh, Spanish comedy, and I had to, I can't even wrap my head around that. Yeah, I had to amazing. I had to spend time in Mexico working with Mexican stand-up comics, and them telling me, "No, you don't say this; you say that. We don't say it like that; we say it like this. We use this word instead of that word, right?" And you're going, like, "Oh, okay, I get it." So I'm kind of I'm kind of starting to get the ball rolling in Mexico, doing Spanish, and then they're going to like, come to Guatemala, and they go, "Oh, by the way." Can you do 15 to 20 percent of your act on local humor, local uh, uh, local observation? And we're like, uh, how, mo how long am I going for? Like, I, am I going to get like a week head start? You know, because how do you adapt to that culture? How do you adapt to to the dialect? How do you adapt to that and still pull off 15 to 20? And I told the promoter, I said, look, honestly, I don't know. And I want to explain something to the people at home who don't understand what it's like to work out a bit. Slash mini bits, jokes, routines. People are like, I saw him do that material five years ago. It takes like 10, 10 years for most comics to come up with a good 30 minutes. Like a good 30 minutes. He's having to come up with 15 in a matter of a week on a culture he doesn't fully understand. So I want to yeah. give you prompts where prompts is yeah, due. Yeah, and they're not, they're not even... That's a difficult process. Yeah, I'm saying a week. They're saying we're going to fly you in the day before the show. You know, Google it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's one of those things that you just... 
I watch some Guatemalan television. That's the beauty of that's the beauty of the internet now. Is that we? I mean, ten years ago you couldn't do that. Now you can. Yeah. You know, uh, and you catch up on the lingo and the stuff that they say, and you're trying to understand. Uh, it's not even pesos. It's quetzals. You know, so huh. it's a whole different currency, and so you got to kind of understand what's going on. But that's the the next big challenge for me. You know, but it's great. I mean, so um, you're truly international. You're here in the States, all over the United States, Mexico, Guatemala. If the people out there want to find you, where do they look? Uh, I have everything. I don't have a lot of stuff on YouTube. No, just yeah, yeah. social media yeah. is fine. Uh, my social media is at Sam Butler Comedy. And is that Twitter or Instagram? Everything is at okay. Sam Butler Comedy. And Facebook is? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I have a Snap. I'm too old for that, so I don't keep up with Snap. Uh, I did it, and my kids were like, Dad, you need Snapchat? And then I was like, nah, this is dumb. And then I found out that you can, like, you can really get uh, uh, some, some uh, pretty naughty stuff on Snap. And I'm going like, I was just oh, like, I don't have a Tinder. Sorry, ladies. Um, I don't have a grinder. Sorry, fellas. <laughs> you know, but. So you can find them on Sam Butler, at Sam Butler. At Sam Butler Comedy. Comedy. Yeah, and if you Google me, it'll be at Sam Butler Comedy. Okay. Um, I have a couple of Spanish videos up on my YouTube. Don't have a huge following. Um, and that's fine. You know what? You don't want to give all the, way, all the milk away anyway. And, and the thing about it is that uh, I learned early in my career that I really don't want to make stuff public till it is polished. Right. You know, and a lot of young comedians, you see them, they do a set. It's horrible. They don't think it's horrible because they're, they're look, you know, like when, when you're a fat person and you look in the mirror, you don't see a fat person. Somehow your mind tricks you into you seeing yourself as a normal person. And it's weird, but that's, that happens. Well, comics do the same thing. Their, their set's horrible, the audience isn't laughing, and, and they look at their video, and, and, and they follow along, and they go, that was great, and they post it. And then there's a video out there that I did when I first started, and I didn't put it up. Somebody else put it up, and it's still there. And people were like, yeah, it wasn't too bad, and I'm going like, this is horrible when I first started. But that's gotten me booked places, which is crazy, right? Because uh, I'll get booked and they're like, yeah, I got you. And then they'll, they'll be like, come on down, right? And then, and then, uh, and then uh, I'll get there and I'll destroy and they go, you're a lot better than we thought you were. My you know? friend always said that when we were in high school. He goes, yeah. just always tell the girl that you have small junk. Yeah. No matter what, she'll be impressed. That's kind of... You, you do it, that. You're yeah. like, comedically, I have a small little wiener. Yeah. And then they get there and they see the python. That horrible video has gotten me spots in comedy clubs nice right and you're going like that's that's hard and they're like yeah come on through do a guest spot you kill the guest spot and they're like you want to do a weekend i got you you know i'll tell you what in the in the theme and spirit of we're not going to give you too much we're going to cut this interview short so next time you can watch the follow-up the sequel of sam butler part two that's what we're going to do so we're just going to cut it off we can give them more yeah but i don't want to I don't yeah. want to give her more. Next, I've seen enough of Sam Butler. Yeah, next time we'll do it in a nicer place. I mean, this is a nice place, but... Oh, you guys got to see us. More aesthetically appealing for oh, the Dude, this is that, that home on the road feel, dude. This is it. You're giving people the inside scoop to, like, behind the scenes. Yeah. So we find you at, at Sam Butler Comedy. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for having me on dude, the show. You sh it was a good time over dinner. The yeah. stars are amazing. It's awesome, right? We'll hang out some more. I'll probably come back and visit you just next week. Let's do it and, again. Uh, and for the record, thank you for giving me that recommendation. I do appreciate <laughs> we'll it. We'll get it, man. That was very nice of cool. you. No, so, and anything, you know, uh, hit me up. Uh, if, if you're a young comedian, uh, I'll give you some pointers if you want. Uh, but not too many, uh, you know, I mean... Give them information, not advice, let them digest yeah, it. Yeah, you know, just some pointers, you know. Sure. Uh, I had somebody help me when I first started, and thanks to, to what they told me, I was able to move up, you nice. know. And there's guys that that same information has been passed on to, they never move up. Sure. You know, so anyways, if you, it, whatever, show uh, come by a show. Business. Show business. Show business. That's what it is. Until next time, this is me, your favorite, JJG. Jacob James Garcia with the one and only Sam Butler. Until next time, you guys rock the day and rule the night.